next session is a very interesting topic on international legal order during uh, uh, the power transition. We have uh, Dr. Rajdeep Pakanati uh, who will uh, talk to us. I mean, from uh, uh, after learning from Admiral's uh, uh, perspective, I mean, we we now have a somewhat a clear understanding on various emerging scenarios and the geopolitical challenges to the Indo-Pacific uh, region, uh, especially in the wake, wake of uh, the current developments that he focused on. Uh, but where do we stand as a cosmopolitan uh, unit and a global player and uh, legal entities? Uh, our next speaker, uh, Professor Rajdeep uh, Pakanati, Associate Professor in the Jindal School of International Affairs, OP Jindal uh, Global University, will take us through equations of a rule-based international order in the Indo-Pacific theater. Uh, Rajdeep's research interests include uh, international relations, comparative politics, international law, uh, and the global governance and India-China in international history. In particular, he has been engaged uh, with issues of uh, transparency and accountability and how they contribute to good governance. Uh, Professor Rajdeep has earned his master's degree in uh, politics and international relations and an MPhil degree in international law from Jawaharlal University, my alma mater, and his PhD in political science and international relations is from the University of uh, Delanware, USA. Uh, with this brief introduction, it's uh, over to Rajdeep. I, I suppose, Rajdeep, you have a presentation to uh, make, uh, um, and probably you will take uh, half an hour, 40 minutes for your talk, and then we'll open for interaction. Uh, thank you, uh, Professor Sridhar, for inviting me, um, and I thank uh, Professor Admiral Lamba, uh, Lamba for providing a larger context uh, and also uh, bringing his immense expertise of working uh, in, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the in the Navy, uh, and I think they have practical insights uh, and more concrete things. Uh, I, as a scholar of international relations and a student of international law, also uh, will try to uh, provide a little bit more broader uh, perspective. So I'll share uh, my screen uh, for a presentation. So I hope uh, everyone is able to uh, look at uh, uh, the screen. Yes, uh, yes. Uh, so uh, the uh, emphasis uh, that I intend to do in this presentation is on the international legal order uh, in the context of a power transition. So there will be some overlap uh, with uh, the presentation of uh, Admiral Lamba. So I will try to uh, skip rather than elaborate more uh, if there is some overlap. So the first uh, thing that I uh, you know, would be helpful uh, is to uh, raise a question as to what is the Indo-Pacific? And uh, simply put, it is a cartographical imagination. And uh, such imagination uh, might arise in, from focus on geographical boundaries, or they could arise by focusing on political boundaries, or they could arise in the context of some imaginary boundaries. Uh, these could be uh, in terms of say democratic or authoritarian, et cetera. The first two geographical and political boundaries, I think uh, are explanatory in, in some way on their own. So what this primarily means is that depending on where one stands uh, in the ASEAN countries, Australia, China, India, Japan, or the United States, it will be perceived differently and these through these three prisms. So therefore, the Indo-Pacific region is still being in some ways constructed. It's not uh, you know, uh, something that's already we have reached it. Um, uh, it's still being constructed. And the primary reason is uh, that it is due to China's rise and what can be uh, emphasized as a relative decline, decline of the US alliance system. I think if we do a, a direct calculation about power capabilities between the United States and China, uh, you know, the United States still today oh, uh, spends uh, more uh, on their military uh, capabilities uh, you know, than the next 10 countries. Uh, so there is, uh, in terms of the number game, et cetera, you know, there's an obvious edge but uh, the uh, interesting part is in terms of how the United States uh, for the last, uh, uh, you know, in the last century and in, into the newer, in this century, 
has relied also on a very strong alliance system. And there, uh, it seems, the alliance system is fraying, uh, some issue, uh, issues have risen. And so uh, the Indo-Pacific, in that sense, uh, is now emerging as a potential site for a new uh, alliance system. So here are uh, some representations. Uh, if uh, you know, this is an imagination, one can say, of, uh, uh, a, uh, of the United States as to where it views the Indo-Pacific. And it is a little bit more concrete for the United States because it already has a presence uh, in the form of an active name. And uh, the uh, changes uh, uh, that have done are more in the form of um, uh, uh, the nomenclature uh, rather than actually a change or addition of actual capabilities. You know, the, uh, their naval capabilities um, uh, uh, have been there and they have been given more focus right now. And it is argued that the recent exit from Afghanistan might be um, uh, one other uh, uh, opportunity for the United States to strengthen its capabilities here. But it hasn't been realized yet. It's, as of now, it is still uh, in a basis uh, of a prior capability, but giving it more focus. Another you know, simple kind of um, a re representation is you know, uh, move the map, and as you can see from this particular perspective, uh, the you know, United States is absent, uh, but uh, you know, we can still imagine this as the Indo-Pacific region. So there, you know, we are focusing uh, far more or we could give more prim uh, uh, primacy, say to countries like India or uh, countries uh, like uh, Australia and Japan to some extent. So depending on where one stands, um, and of course the ASEAN countries. So depending on where one stands, uh, the conceptualization and the way we are going to uh, imagine about the Indo-Pacific is going to differ. Uh, but uh, uh, there are many meanings and uh, it would be useful uh, for anyone to pay a little bit more attention to the specific use of Indo-Pacific region uh, whenever we are approaching this particular topic. So uh, one way we could do that is by trying to uh, shed a little bit more light on who are the actors in the Indo-Pacific. Uh, and here I've just illustrated them in a alphabetical order rather than in terms of importance. And uh, uh, a, uh, an important one uh, you know, uh, would be the ASEAN countries, uh, which occupy a center space, uh, say, in the, uh, in the map that I just uh, uh, shared with you. And what we find is that uh, the ASEAN countries uh, uh, have taken cognizance of it, and they have decided uh, uh, through the ASEAN outlook um, uh, of the in, on the Indo-Pacific 2019 uh, statement that they would like to emphasize or focus on four areas of cooperation. Uh, that is maritime cooperation, connectivity, uh, UN sustainable development goals, and economic development. So they hope uh, to essentially build on what is already on their agenda. You know, there is uh, uh, really nothing new, uh, uh, but they want to build on it and uh, uh, therefore collectively contribute um, uh, and engage uh, in the, uh, uh, the Indo-Pacific uh, region or the conceptualization. Uh, other countries uh, uh, like Australia uh, have uh, been formulated uh, in terms of uh, what they uh, uh, hope would be a stable and prosperous Indo-Pacific. China, uh, you know, has to be uh, acknowledged, I believe, uh, clearly, uh, because uh, the Indo-Pacific uh, uh, conceptualization and engagement is arising predominantly due to China's actions, as I've already said about China's rights. So one in specific initiative that they have is on the Belt and Road Initiative, which I'll try to maybe uh, elaborate up uh, if I get a chance, uh, uh, Admiral Lamba has pointed out uh, some uh, 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 that the BRI has uh, lost steam, uh, which I do agree uh, with him. But there are some um, uh, additional dimensions that uh, about the BRI uh, which are less uh, uh, analyzed and less focused. Uh, uh, and one of them, uh, which I think is you know useful in the context of my emphasis on international law, is how China through the BRI projects is trying to alter uh, the architecture and more specifically uh, 
uh, in terms of the regulatory architecture. So they want to engage different countries and go and influence their countries in different issue areas. Uh, it could be um, uh, in trying to bring new standards uh, uh, in, you know, in building construction, it could be uh, trying to bring, you know, bring new standards uh, uh, in road or you know, infrastructure construction, uh, or it could be support, uh, 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 sorry, uh, support uh, to uh, 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 local institutions. And that is something uh, which China is continuing to do on the BRI. Um, and I think you know, that is going to have some meaningful impact. So we have to uh, pay attention uh, to that, and I'll try to elaborate also uh, you know, later. Um, and of course, uh, they are uh, uh, clearly uh, seeking to assert themselves in South China Sea, which was uh, uh, discussed, and uh, uh, it was also part of the question that was raised by uh, Pat Spencer. Um, from the perspective of India, what we hope to do is uh, uh, look at the Indo-Pacific as a free, open, inclusive, rules-based uh, Indo-Pacific. And uh, you know, this. Um, uh, reference to rules based, I think, is uh, also um, uh, much uh, centered on multilateral uh, uh, agreements, and I'm uh, including UNCLOS and WTO, which I'll elaborate uh, later. Japan uh, is again, uh, of course, going to uh, carve out a, a, a space uh, in this region and play an important role, and they uh, utilize or uh, frame it as a free and open Indo Pacific and the United States have also equals uh, uh, a similar terminology. So uh, when we are focusing on the Indo-Pacific region, I think uh, uh, we, by always referring to these primary actors uh, and more specifically focusing on their uh, specific and collective actions, we will be able to uh, more clearly articulate what the Indo-Pacific might be. So, uh, I want to address a little bit uh, uh, now on what is the extent rule-based international order. And uh, depending on uh, the scholarship, uh, one particular uh, in a major uh, scholarship uh, in international relations uh, is their emphasis on power politics. And so after the end of the Cold War and in the early 2000s, uh, there has been some analysis about that we have reached a unipolar moment because of the absolute dominance of the United States. But uh, uh, like the way uh, the Taliban has uh, prevailed in some ways, and you know, here uh, I'm talking about an objective fact, uh, you know, at that, uh, in 2001, the Taliban said, you might have the best uh, uh, you know, uh, clocks, but we have you know, time on our side. And that kind of uh, dynamic has played out, wherein the US, uh, uh, in its withdrawal is seen as a defeat. Uh, but as far as the United States is concerned, the US does not imagine uh, or even think, you know, it has, it has been defeated in, uh, uh, in, in Afghanistan, nor has it ever thought that it has been defeated in Vietnam. Uh, it only is a question of uh, focusing its energies elsewhere. And so the withdrawal of United States in Afghanistan, um, rather than being viewed as uh, uh, a defeat. I think uh, what they are also saying is that they intend to focus on uh, the Indo-Pacific region, and we have to wait and see uh, how that is going to be translated uh, in the way they allocate their resources. So it is um, uh, in this particular context that uh, the United States, uh, uh, you know, occupied a brief unipolar movement, and there is some question of relative decline. Uh, again, a lot of scholarship has focused um, the, about. Uh, the so-called U.S. decline, uh, but I think you know it. Um, uh, the U.S. seems to, um, uh, you know, this, this uh, U.S. decline uh, 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 literature was there for almost twenty years now. But uh, in, I think it's it, um, they have prevailed in many ways, um, um, and they have a, a ecosystem uh, that I think you know uh, enables them. Uh, of course, you know their advantages uh, uh, of uh, geography, etc., are uh, quite important. But uh, uh, I think a um, uh, thing to focus right now about the United States is their alliance system. And I think you know, uh, that is in a flux rather than a decline, or maybe it's a relative decline. Um, another way uh, we can approach um, uh, international relations and you know, trying to uh, imagine what this rule-based uh, international order might be is 
uh, what is emphasized as a kind of a liberal order, uh, which is underpinned by multilateral legal frameworks uh, embedded in the United Nations, uh, the WTO, uh, the UN Convention of the Law of the Sea, and various climate change uh, treaties like the Paris Accord. So uh, here, I think um, uh, there, uh, there is uh, uh, some changes uh, or there are some challenges being uh, posed to each of these uh, uh, frameworks, but I don't uh, envisage a withering away. So uh, uh, one way we can try to evaluate is by looking at what are the major principles uh, that guide these multilateral institutions. Uh, if we focus on the United Nations, um, one of the major principles, of course, is on prohibition of the use of force. Um, another or correlated factor is the peaceful settlement of disputes. Um, and also the United Nations being at the center to address all international challenges. Uh, so here, uh, on the question of use of force, I think you know, China uh, in general, in different, uh, uh, you know, in both uh, through their rhetoric and behavior, uh, 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 is uh, 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 is uh, in, uh, you, uh, it takes a defensive uh, in outlook, but uh, there are uh, some instances, including our uh, border matters, where they have used force. Uh, and I'll elaborate on that particular use of force, um, uh, or you know, uh, or the specific dynamic between India and China in a minute. But in general, uh, I think the threat that they pose uh, to other countries. Uh, in terms of you know domination etc i think is unfounded uh, but uh, with regarding to taiwan uh, about um, uh, they continue to emphasize uh, a peaceful um, uh, means uh, to integrate taiwan but uh, if uh, uh, you know if uh, you know, i think a, a use of force uh, were to occur uh, i think uh, there is a, um, a, it might be more due to strategic miscalculation uh, rather than a clear intent, uh, which is um, uh, generally the case uh, uh, elsewhere also in history. Uh, so I think Taiwan as a flashpoint uh, is something uh, to focus on. But uh, um, uh, one way to uh, interpret this is uh, as China is uh, rising, uh, um, I think whatever um, image it has uh, in the world, uh, it knows that it will take not just a severe beating. I think it will become a pariah in the international community if it were to use force on Taiwan, uh, because then it will just raise the ha ha hackles of every country that you know they are willing to use force um, in a way on their own people. And I think that is uh, you know definitely a calculus uh, on their part. Um, and um, uh, the uh, the the, uh, the uh, there is more chance of some. Uh, miscalculation rather than a willingness. You know, this is my in a way that I'm reading. On the question of uh, peaceful settlement of disputes, uh, true, China did not uh, participate um, in the uh, in the uh, uh, arbitration uh, on the South China Sea dispute, dispute uh, initiated by the Philippines. But China has um, in uh, indirectly. Uh, but through the issue of uh, white papers and um, uh, has tried to influence the judgment also. And uh, it seems, uh, uh, you know, they, uh, uh, they are now, uh, you know, of course, uh, the status quo has been altered as uh, Admiral Lamba has pointed out. So they are uh, 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 realizing uh, that uh, the international community uh, will rely on uh, uh, legal approaches uh, and they do pay attention to it. And, uh, uh, you know, they're not yet, signaled that they are walking away in a way from uh, this approach also. Um, and a third uh, you know, point about the United Nations uh, trying to address all international challenges, uh, China is actually taking steps actively to, uh, 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 to seek more leadership position within the United Nations, uh, either through direct contributions uh, or through active participation and the election of its um, representatives in different uh, commissions and councils, uh, et cetera. So it has not, um, um, uh, you know, uh, changed in yet. And they are actually quite engaged and, you know, very interested. Uh, but I think a question might arise, which is, you know, whether there's a kind of a new Cold War with, between the United States and China. Uh, and so it's a question rather than, uh, you know, uh, 
any decisive answer that can be provided. Uh, in the WTO, and that you know brings to the economic arena. Uh, you know, this is just a, a kind of a background in terms of uh, um, for uh, all the participants who might uh, uh, be uh, you know to just bring them on you know to speed uh, with a larger intent um, in the WTO and generally the multilateral uh, trading agreements. Uh, the idea is to promote uh, trade without discrimination uh, by emphasizing on what is called as a most favored nation clause. Uh, wherein uh, if a country were to um, extend a certain level of tariff to any uh, member state in the WTO, uh, it should be extended to all other members in the WTO. And a similar, another thing is with regarding to national treatment of goods, uh, which is in terms of trying to uh, provide, uh, ensure that there will be no discrimination between goods uh, from another country and their own country. And this is a, you know, a, a, something that is being pursued in almost all uh, multilateral trade agreements. It's an it's a important uh, thing that they want to uh, uh, promote and it's uh, reflected even in free, uh, in free trade agreements also. And WTO stands out because um, uh, of its ability to provide a framework on trading in goods, services, and intellectual property rights. And uh, what they intended to do was uh, to promote predictability through bindingness and transparency. and it also had a very effective dispute settlement body uh, in the WTO. Um, and it uh, uh, sought to encourage development and economic reform. Uh, but here, uh, definitely, uh, the uh, tensions in the international uh, realm have affected uh, the WTO, wherein we have today reached a stalemate, as there are no members in the appellate body, which is part of the dispute settlement body. And uh, it has therefore rendered the dispute settlement process ineffective. But that does not mean uh, countries are abandoning the WTO framework as it is. It is actually uh, really enmeshed. Countries are really enmeshed in it. Uh, they have put in play you know, procedures, et cetera. Uh, and you know, we are not uh, uh, going to disentangle uh, in easily with the framework provided by the WTO. Uh, in fact, uh, there is um, um, some uh, uh, reports and uh, I've heard the discussions in the Indian government uh, that is uh, uh, we are looking um, uh, to find a way to uh, what is being termed as decouple ourselves from China as far as uh, uh, you know our trade relations go uh, but it is not going to be an easy task uh, because we uh, 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 if we want to uh, disentangle ourselves with China not only uh, us but anyone else uh, they will have to one uh, either find a domestic uh, industry which can provide that good uh, because you know uh, China's uh, primary contribution in global trade is on the goods uh, or uh, find an alternate provider you know somewhere in the world or in our region and it's not easy uh, so we are quite in that sense entangled uh, through the WTO uh, uh, framework. Uh, the, another one uh, that I wanted to also mention uh, for the participants uh, to provide a little bit detail about, uh, is by focusing on the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea, uh, which uh, primarily relies on extended coastal state jurisdiction. And I will uh, utilize, illustrate that with a map in a moment. And uh, in addition to that, uh, what it does is it provides a comprehensive international regime and organization, uh, which seeks to preserve and protect the common heritage of mankind. Uh, it also uh, puts a strict obligation for flag states and uh, uh, it uh, seeks to facilitate unhindered freedom of navigation, uh, which is asserted and exercised by the United States through the uh, freedom of navigation operations or phone ops as they are referred. Now here, uh, I think you might know the United States is not a party to the UNCLOS, but as far as its uh, uh, behavior goes, uh, it is very, um, uh, much in line uh, with the expectations and uh, commitments under run clause. Uh, the uh, re primary reason uh, why the United States uh, is not a party to the run clause uh, is attributable to their domestic uh, politics and more uh, specifically the opposition in the Senate. And there um, uh, is uh, increasing dialogue and even uh, encouragement by different uh, stakeholders in the US um, government to uh, encourage uh, US to join the UNCLOS. Uh, but um, in the meanwhile, uh, United States um, uh, carries out these freedom of navigation operations, uh, which are permitted under by UNCLOS. And other countries 
in the Indo-Pacific are also going to rely on this uh, because it provides them a legal basis to carry that out. So here is a, a, a illustration uh, which uh, is useful. Uh, I do not know if uh, participants here have encountered this before or not, uh, but uh, by uh, Dan Claus provides, uh, you know, this is you know this is the land from where the baseline is, uh, you know, st starts, and the territorial sea can be imagined as if it's a, uh, you know, it's a, the rights everything are akin to having the rights on the land. Uh, in addition to that, uh, the exclusive economic zone uh, gives the coastal country. Uh, exclusive fisheries rights and exclusive rights to mineral resources. Um, and the continental shelf, which is this white kind of component as it you know, slopes forward, uh, the coastal state has uh, uh, some uh, additional rights to mineral resources after the process to establish uh, the outer border of the continental shelf. Uh, and here I want to also alert uh, the participants that um, both India and China uh, have uh, submitted extensive uh, claims to the uh, Commission on the Continental Shelf, uh, you know, which uh, uh, looks at uh, the allocation of these uh, uh, rights to these countries uh, on the basis of uh, first come first serve, so based on the submission. And uh, India's uh, uh, is yet to be examined, but we have a, a, a stake, and China also has a, a stake uh, uh, in in gaining the continental um, uh, shelf rights, and they have uh, put forward. Uh, very legitimate claims also. So I think it's, um, uh, and they, 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 what it again say, shows is they show commitment uh, to the extent uh, international legal order. Uh, but uh, one specific way is, you know, they are uh, creating new status quo uh, in, in the South China Sea, uh, but they do have some commitment and they do have uh, adhere to the extent of framework uh, and imagination in a way also. And, from uh, this particular point in time, uh, you know, we see, we start seeing uh, uh, in terms of the high seas where all the countries may fish here and go to sea. And the Indo-Pacific uh, is going to, you know, the, the rights and claims over rights are going to play out in this particular one. And a primary one is the freedom of nav uh, navigation operations. And the other one, of course, are the uh, channels to, uh, for international shipping, uh, which pass through, region, through this region. Um, in the context, I think if uh, uh, the, the participants have not seen this before, uh, this is a useful illustration from the BBC, uh, which uh, shows a, uh, the claims you know, that China made and uh, uh, the claims that are going to accrue to different countries in the ASEAN region, uh, according to uh, the UNCLOS 200 nautical mile exclusive economic zone. So uh, while China, as you know, you can say, uh, tries to say everything is mine, uh, all of these countries in this region are, are, are signatories to the UNCLOS and they have these rights. And so they are not going to, you know, uh, uh, easily uh, give them up or, you know, uh, and what China will continue possibly to do is uh, to try to alter the situation, you know, through, uh, uh, through this uh, uh, nibbling away or uh, in some scholars say the salami tax. So one uh, particular thing that I want to, to uh, bring to the attention of uh, the participants uh, uh, here is um, as far as the international legal order and more specifically international law goes, uh, India and China um, uh, have a you know, difference uh, in approach. Uh, India looks at its, uh, itself as a successor state to Britain. Um, and what it means is that you know, we, uh, uh, you know, lay primary emphasis on uh, uh, on the MacMahon line um, and all the treaties that Great Britain entered into, and we present that as a perspective as far as our, our boundaries, rights, etc. go. Uh, but China has, um, uh, even before the establishment of the PRC, uh, viewed many of those agreements as unequal treaties foisted upon it, and therefore denounced them after the establishment of the PRC in 1949. And this difference in approach um, is a primary reason for our border dispute. And uh, I do not, uh, you know, I cannot envisage, you know, what is the way out. Uh, it's um, uh, because we fundamentally seem to approach the problem in, in, in you know, through different lens. Um, and so there is a, 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 a paradigmatically, you know, we are, uh, uh, you know, maybe possibly on, on a parallel tracks. Uh, so that is something that, uh, you know, where, you know, where leadership uh, uh, 
uh, how it is going to negotiate is going to you know, matter. Uh, um, uh, and there, again, uh, I believe uh, that the Indian uh, government also has to communicate uh, um, or, or, you know, in a way, prepare uh, the Indian uh, audience if we are to you know, alter in any way. Uh, because we, uh, uh, in terms of our you know, boundaries, we are, there is no space for negotiation uh, as far as uh, India. You know, no political party uh, you know, can uh, um, uh, take a chance on, uh, on, on uh, questioning or compromising on border, borders and boundaries. Uh, so I think you know, we are uh, both committed to our uh, you know, respective positions. Uh, and on the part about the United States is that you know, it views itself as a exception, uh, uh, exceptional state. And I think that is not particular to the United States, but it will be particular you know, to all these great powers. So China might be uh, on the way to view itself as an exceptional state also. So uh, when it comes to, uh, you know, in the light of uh, the above facts, I think uh, some questions that arise are, what should the international community do at the time of power transition? And uh, uh, you know, it was whether strengthen or reorient existing frameworks or build new frameworks. So uh, I believe there are some signs that countries are investing in new international institutions like an in economic arena, uh, like the New Development Bank, AIIB, et cetera, along with some emergent multilateral trade frameworks uh, like the Comprehensive and Progressive Agreement for the Trans-Pacific Partnership and the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership. Uh, what it uh, means um, is that, uh, uh, you know, through this particular one, uh, we see a, alternate framework uh, and uh, being developed, but uh, more than alternate, I believe it is more complementary to existing frameworks. Uh, as I said about the WTO uh, earlier, uh, it is a, a really uh, enmeshed um, uh, framework. You know, countries are really tied, they, they cannot untangle so easily. And these agreements uh, as illustrated here uh, through the, uh, uh, through the in, uh, in the countries, uh, these two, RCEP and the uh, CP, uh, TPP, uh, are going to play an important role and how uh, they are going to function uh, will have a direct uh, uh, impact on the uh, Indo-Pacific. Um, the CPTPP has come into effect. Um, uh, if I'm not wrong, Chile um, and Malaysia have uh, are yet to uh, ratify it, um, whereas RCEP has been agreed upon, but uh, countries are yet to ratify it. Uh, so if and when they come into uh, effect, uh, when RCP comes into effect, uh, it is going to be, uh, uh, in terms of uh, only going to deepen uh, the ties in this particular region. So in the security arena, uh, I think, you know, Quad, uh, AUKUS, et cetera, are, have been touched upon, so I'll not elaborate much, but um, uh, one uh, particular uh, uh, thing uh, to note is that uh, in the, uh, uh, today, uh, uh, we are going to find uh, that the technological space uh, is, uh, you know, will be a major, you know, bone of contention, and uh, that is uh, playing out in the form of denying technology to and uh, of Huawei, uh, especially in, in 5G telecommunications, which everyone uh, might be aware. Um, uh, so um, it's more than the technology. I think that it is about the underlying architecture uh, that is uh, um, uh, the countries in the Indo-Pacific are going to resist. I had included this uh, uh, illustration uh, in terms of, you know, just to capture the attention, but uh, I think uh, many of you uh, know, and uh, Admiral Lamba has uh, uh, also covered uh, quite a bit, so I'll not elaborate on, uh, on this. And I will uh, uh, try to summarize or, you know, in lieu of a conclusion. Uh, I want to uh, flag one potential area where cooperation might be feasible, and that is in the area of climate change. Uh, um, so many of you will know uh, that the existing international uh, agreements on climate change uh, were uh, uh, more focused on reduction and some specific targets, and which were changed uh, in, the, uh, uh, in the Paris Accord uh, where they put more onus on countries uh, to take the lead, uh, and it is uh, reflected in the formulation called intended uh, uh, nationally determined contributions. Uh, 
which is uh, contributions to the greenhouse gases and they uh, intend to uh, reduce. Uh, uh, so uh, uh, the world over, uh, I think all the countries uh, are facing direct challenges to, you know, due to climate change, uh, be it in the United States, be it in, uh, in Europe or in India or in China. And they are, this I think might be one area uh, where we might be uh, uh, seeking some cooperation. Uh, so how we envisage the Indo-Pacific uh, could also change if uh, uh, some action happens, uh, you know, some cooperation happens in the climate change. Uh, it could um, uh, help in mitigating or de-escalating. Um, so uh, what I want to uh, uh, do is in terms in lieu of conclusion, say that like every imaginative space, uh, the Indo-Pacific is a construct of, of con contested interpretation and uh, necessitating warring visions and constructs likely to be wrestled out between opposed strategic stakeholders in the region. Uh, this I've been you know, borrowed from a scholar, uh, which is referenced here. Uh, so it all you know, boils back to the individual uh, uh, dynamics uh, and the dyadic uh, dynamics, say, between India and the United States or uh, India and Australia or India and Japan or Japan and the US. Uh, so th those are going to be far more meaningful, uh, uh, in my opinion, rather than this um, uh, holistic uh, uh, approach to uh, the Indo-Pacific. So if anyone is focusing or is interested in the Indo-Pacific is to start uh, paying a little bit more attention uh, uh, to, say, the relationship between the United States and India, the relationship between India and Australia, uh, before uh, uh, tying them together to what might look as a uh, Indo-Pacific uh, uh, you know, plan of action or approach or cooperation or however one might exist. Well, thank you very much uh, for the opportunity. I will stop here and, uh, and open up uh, and open for questions. Thank you, Rajdeep. It was a real interesting presentation. Um, we will now open the floor for some discussion and question answers. Um, can I ask the first one to go? <laughs> yeah, uh, of course, we have uh, heard a lot that uh, the lot of multilateral uh, uh, organizations uh, could be in a downfall. Like, do you think there is a decline of WTO as a multilateral institution? And if yes, how will it impact the Indo-Pacific development cooperation? Uh, so one, you know, one way to en en envisage about the fate of the WTO uh, is to see um, uh, in terms of you know, what actions countries might be taking to undermine it. Uh, but I think in the context of trying to imagine about the Indo-Pacific, the major concern for any country you know, today in the world is uh, that um, uh, you know, how to reduce the dependency of China. You know? And that's not a question, you know, that will be solved in five, ten, you know, uh, years or so. Uh, so, uh, so uh, yeah, what it means is that they have a direct interest uh, in playing with, with the extent rules. Um, uh, so, um, the the, the uh, lack of appellate body members in the WTO it might mean some major disputes. Uh, which might have been, you know, uh, how to say, not a pen, uh, you know, countries did not act upon. Uh, this might provide them an opportunity to, uh, to bring them out. Say maybe, um, so for example, India um, lost a case to the United States uh, over uh, our requirements of domestic uh, uh, content on solar panels. Uh, what we have now done is we have lobbed this, uh, you know, we lost the case. Now we have lobbed it to the appellate body, but there is no one to determine on that. So in the meanwhile, you know, what is India doing? Actually, India uh, is, you know, acknowledged uh, the decision of the WTO to some extent to actually, we are not, you know, completely flouting, you know, because we want our space to, you know, be viewed as someone who adheres to rules, laws, et cetera. And the panel report is an important signal. Uh, right. So we are adhering to it largely. Uh, but I think, and that is where uh, uh, there is enough space if we only reformulate uh, different uh, problems, say between India or China, or you know US and China, uh, or look at them through other lenses. And I believe climate change, uh, even dealing with pandemic, uh, can provide some opportunity. And while dealing with that, the extent framework will enable. 
you know, it's, it's, it's a very robust framework. Uh, it has created very uh, 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 solid connections between countries. Um, and the, what I mentioned about the CPTPP or RCEP are actually talking about, you know, going further, you know, deepening, not uh, lesser. Uh, true, world over, when we look at, call it, in the, say, open a newspaper, uh, we see a lot of national rhetoric. Uh, but substance-wise, I still, you know, uh, see countries wanting to do more with each other, you know, not less. Because problems and, you know, concerns are, are, are of that nature. Uh, so I think WTO is going to you know, function um, uh, stay uh, for some time, um, and some problems might you know become how to say. Uh, uh, for example, anti-dumping duties uh, is a matter that has you know countries have a right and they have to exercise it uh, you know through their own domestic mechanism. It's not some uh, so where countries find they are going to utilize it um, uh, uh, and. Uh, um, uh, a small, a more interesting thing in, in the, that um, I, I'm trying to pay more attention and trying to learn is how through BRI, uh, China is trying to influence individual countries um, to uh, change their local laws, regulations, you know, which might be more. Um, what is more visible is uh, like the 5G uh, technology through Huawei, where they want uh, uh, the protocols, uh, technological standards, etc., uh, to be more. Um, guided by what uh, Huawei might offer, but they are doing that in the area of architecture, uh, in, in construction sector primarily, um, and uh, to some extent, uh, even, in, uh, even in energy use. Uh, China has on its own said they are going to commit to carbon neutrality, uh, but uh, through BRI, there are a lot of projects which are still carbon intensive. Uh, I think this um, uh, is something which needs more attention. A small point that I want to add to uh, uh, what uh, Admiral Lamba mentioned about the common Dota and other things is, um, if you look at just the BRI as it, it was, a, 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 how to say, unveiled in 2013. But one thing in China, uh, you know, we, uh, what uh, people do is, uh, how to say, put the label of whichever might be the top words today. So what they have done is they have backtracked a lot of things that were happening even before 2012 and put them as BRI. And so we, you know, suddenly BRI, you know, uh, uh, you know, made a big, uh, uh, how to say, splash. Uh, but it is just, um, you know, far more market driven um, uh, and engagement that was already there, being sought after, discussed. Uh, so I think the extent framework um, uh, is still strong, um, um, and I think, uh, in, even for, in, from the perspective of India, uh, there is no need for us to abandon. Uh, we should, you know, try to. Uh, uh, de-escalate, say to say, like so to say, our tensions are also uh, uh, until and unless you know we can find either an alternate domestically or some other partner, say in our region or in some other place in the world. Uh, and it's not an easy task, and um, uh, it's a, it's a multilateral effort. It's not a unilateral effort. Thank you for that. Um, we have a series of questions in the. Chat box, would you like to take it or should I read it? Oh, no, I, I can, you know, I'll look at them. Uh, uh, thank you, uh, uh, Dennis Jezdasan. Uh, it's again nice to reconnect here. I had uh, met you some time ago uh, to interview on my transparency research. Um, uh, what uh, Mr. Dennis is uh, raising is, uh, do we think the multinational efforts to ensure uh, a rules-based order in the Indo-Pacific also run the risk of unintentionally instigating Australia uh, to become a nuclear power uh, though it has been nuclear weapon free, and uh, more specifically about the nuclear powered submarines, uh, I don't think so uh, because uh, the, uh, the um, what the United States is doing is uh, uh, it is uh, transferring uh, uh, in a way uh, it will you know provide a fully built submarine, uh, and the USP and I think um, uh, Admiral Lamba can maybe add uh, uh, in a little bit more technical detail is uh, the nuclear powered vehicles. Uh, is that it's like a closed box, uh, you know, which has a set lifetime and, you know, the energy is produced, you know, which is used for these, uh, either the aircraft carriers or submarines. So um, um, uh, in terms of, uh, say, there will not be uh, a direct, you know, a material, you know, fission material transfer to Australia. Uh, we cannot envisage that. And uh, um, as far as uh, uh, in, uh, in uh, uh, maintenance, so to say, uh, Australia will have to rely on the United States and, you know, U.S. will, again, has no interest, uh, uh, you know, for it to proliferate or things like that. So I think it's going to be that, my hunch is it's going to be that very specific. 
And one might say we already have a template in the form of you know how India and US has done on the nuclear deal, wherein we are like saying we will have a a, a military a kind of agreement, part of the agreement under full international safeguards. Although we, India is not a party to NPT, etc., and a civilian you know content which will you know we will manage domestically. So I don't think um, uh, the sharing or, or in the sale of submarines will push Australia to uh, acquire. Uh, uh, so I do not you know really envisage uh, you know them going overtly. Um, uh, I think you know a more uh, concerning thing in the whole of this Indo-Pacific would be Japan. Uh, uh, you know they have immense latent capability, uh, capability. So uh, rather than Australia, uh, Admiral Lamba, maybe if you would like to maybe chip in in terms of uh, uh, your knowledge and uh, about uh, these nuclear submarines. No, we have to view it into separate uh, way. A, a nuclear powered submarine doesn't mean you are a nuclear weapon state. A nuclear powered submarine is just that the propulsion plant of the submarine runs on a nuclear on a react on a nuclear reactor so it has unlimited range yes. but uh, it will not be i'm quite sure it will not carry any nuclear weapons on board so i don't think so australia is going to be a nuclear weapon state but it will have nuclear powered submarines so that's a separate thing so nuclear powered you have to compare conventional submarine which run on electric batteries and nuclear powered submarine there are entirely different. This thing, nuclear part submarines, you have unlimited range and endurance. Endurance is limited by the human endurance of the crew. But the conventional submarine is limited in its endurance and has to come up to charge its batteries. So, nuclear part submarine brings huge capability, and that is why India is also going down this route of having nuclear powered submarines. But we are a nuclear weapon state. That is a very separate thing. Absolutely. Right. And I think if I am correct, you know, like if I'm not wrong, uh, it's a closed system. So it is not, um, uh, you know, a system that the propulsion, you know, the you know the reactor is a closed system that the US will submit, uh, will uh, uh, will offer to Australia, and it's inbuilt into that, you know, the larger summary. It's not like something of uh, so the, uh, the nuclear power, uh, the nuclear power plant. Is a particular section of the submarine. Mm. Okay, now I don't know what kind of technology with the United States is going to transfer to Australia, but uh, the United States uses uh, very highly refined uh, uranium for the nuclear propulsion plant for the submarines and the nuclear powered aircraft carrier, where they do not need to be refueled in the entire life cycle of 30 years. Yes. While uh, France and uh, Russia you know, have low enriched uranium, where every, depending on the usage, every three to four, four to five years, or maybe at an interval of 10 years, you have to refuel the nuclear reactor of the submarine or the aircraft carrier. And that takes at least three to four years of downtime to do that. So, in a life cycle of 30 years, Depending on what are the enrichment levels of uranium you use in a nuclear power, you'll have to refuel your submarine or aircraft carrier. Like the French nuclear aircraft carrier, Charles de Gaulle has just come out from a nuclear refueling exercise, which has taken almost three years downtime. Where Americans now used highly enriched uranium where you don't need to refuel. So I'm quite sure they will transfer this technology at the moment. They only share it with the, partly with the with the United Kingdom and nobody else. Um, thank you, sir. Um, so uh, I hope that has answered uh, Dennis's uh, question, um, Mr. Uh, Ajit Andare. Uh, post AUKUS, uh, what new challenges can India expect in the Indo-Pacific region theater? Uh, I think uh, related to a question by uh, Mr. Moinuddin Ahmed also. Uh, where does the track to diplomacy sets in this case, and is there any space for that? It, I think most of the countries right now, the primary challenge is to come out of the COVID crisis. Uh, you know, despite the fact uh, that um, uh, vaccines, you know, have been rolled out, uh, even uh, you know, treatment uh, options are on, you know, on the table, uh, we are still uh, far away uh, from, uh, uh, from you know, individual countries uh, to deal with COVID. And I think, uh, 
their primary energy, uh, you know, by different countries is going to be uh, on that uh, uh, in dealing with them. Uh, and so, um, uh, and in this effort, there might be a chance for countries to uh, decouple themselves from China uh, in, in, in their, through the national policies, um, which uh, uh, under normal circumstances might have been, you know, complained, etc. But China itself is uh, taking an approach of a kind of a closed uh, uh, approach, right? So it cannot complain too much about other countries' uh, policies. Uh, so I think the, 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 the near term, of, you know, I think challenge is for all the countries to come out of uh, uh, COVID. Uh, and that is where, as countries come out of the COVID crisis, a uh, potential track to might open up. Uh, right now, uh, one particular uh, thing that I'm, you know, uh, looking or learning uh, about China is uh, that I have been personally been interested to go uh, and try to teach in China for a few years also and deepen my knowledge about China. Um, um, and uh, I had gone last gone there in 2018, and it, that was the beginning of the trade war. Uh, and at that time, I did um, uh, seek out a few universities to find an opportunity to teach and you know uh, research there, and they were so hopeful. But uh, the trade war and then the COVID crisis has really closed that space. Um, uh, you know, university professors, uh, et cetera, that I know of um, uh, in, you know, from China, they are pointing out uh, that they are very, uh, you know, trying hard to retain ex existing international faculty uh, in China. So I think, you know, there's a, you know, a become a deep uh, freeze in relations with China, with China and the rest of the world. And as far as people trying to learn more about China, uh, do research in general on different issue areas. It could be climate change, all of those, one might say non-political or less uh, sensitive topics. Uh, their access to China has become reduced across, you know, from scholars in Europe, uh, you know, US, of course, Australia, uh, and India has always been less. And so we are, um, uh, so I don't know where the track to space can emerge, actually. Uh, so um, one hoped uh, that, you know, um, uh, uh, in the international coordinated efforts to tackle COVID, there could be that vaccine diplomacy of you know trying to do together, uh, but I think uh, both India India is pursuing its own you know vaccine diplomacy and China is uh, pursuing its own you know vaccine diplomacy. Uh, so you know there is no space. Um, you know in, you know when we talk about track two, we are talking about collaboration, say interactions between journalists, you know scientists, researchers, uh, you know artists, theater. You know it's it's all. Uh, I think there is barely any space left. Um, not just with India and China, but also China and say Europe, China and US, China and Australia. So right now uh, the space has really uh, shrunk. Uh, so state-to-state uh, -state interaction, you know, uh, seems to be the primary one. And even there, you all know, uh, it's almost a year now, and uh, um, uh, uh, President Biden and the, uh, President Xi Jinping haven't met in person. You know, uh, uh, they have decided to meet uh, virtually though before the end of the year. So that is, you know, um, showing how um, uh, less contact or ties are there with China at the moment. Uh, so uh, till I think the, the, both, I think not only China, but also as we are focused on coming out of COVID. And I think that's where countries focus. Uh, uh, Dr. Mukun with uh, Narvai uh, raises a question as to, uh, whether there's a greater need of assimilation of Melanesia, Micronesia, and Polynesians into the great debate of rule-based international order in the Indo-Pacific. Uh, because being island states in the region, they say is also a uh, need to be heard by the great powers with respect to their development projects in the region. Uh, thank you very, very much uh, for your question, uh, Dr. Naveka. Um, the point I think uh, with regarding to these uh, countries and the way they can articulate their interest is more in terms of uh, uh, climate change or development challenges rather than security challenges uh, because uh, their existential they are facing existential threat due to climate change and uh, whatnot so um, they have they are trying to articulate that uh, and it is on the agenda um, uh, so i think their contribution um, to uh, you know uh, to the security aspect i think you know is is not going to be much uh, but definitely, uh, I think uh, when it comes to development and other matters, uh, their you know, voice is very important. And as I you know, said earlier about imagining the Indo-Pacific, I think uh, whoever you know, is articulating, uh, I think is about also trying to say, this is an important problem and try to provide a solution. It could be development, it could be economic, and that is going to come out and uh, be meaningful than uh, just relying on the security dimension. I do not know if that, uh, 
France as well, but uh, uh, and uh, um, Mr. Mahesh Kumar has raised uh, most of the countries, uh, in, uh, including India, has been demanding to shed out patent rights on vaccines uh, meant for COVID-19 in order to manufacture uh, the vaccine by each and every country in a joint fight against the worst pandemic. Uh, how do you look at this demand under the international law order? Uh, absolutely, you know, it is permissible um, and both India and South Africa in the WTO have called for a waiver of uh, patent uh, uh, rights to different vaccines that have been developed. Uh, but I, you know, this is uh, one uh, thing that I have uh, followed is uh, uh, with regarding to the RNA-based uh, vaccines that have been developed by Moderna uh, and Pfizer. Uh, they actually uh, bring to the fore completely novel technologies uh, in vaccine making. Uh, unlike uh, uh, Covaxin uh, that India has developed, uh, or even uh, the AstraZeneca, uh, which have relied far more on extent uh, uh, technologies of vaccine development and delivery. Uh, so, uh, 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 and one of the uh, uh, things, uh, you know, when looking at uh, the uh, manufacture of uh, Moderna and other vaccines is, uh, uh, it is, um, uh, you know, far more reliant um, uh, on almost, um, I think a comparable one I could think is uh, about semiconductor, you know, uh, manufacturing. You know, it needs uh, that really high technology, uh, uh, you know, fabricated plants, which in, uh, are you know, absolutely in pristine condition uh, um, uh, and the technologies that they go to filter uh, because this, uh, the way it's, it's being artificially being made uh, where the RNA is replicated, then you have to filter it out Then it has to be um, it's very sensitive uh, RNA. Uh, it's almost like you know nuclear material. It has to be handled sensitively. Uh, the, the RNA material has to be then encased in a uh, uh, in in a uh, in a protein uh, kind of a, uh, like a shake, and then it has to be covered with a lipid kind of uh, molecule. So uh, the, all of them have been uh, you know novel technologies uh, which have been uh, and many of the countries, uh, including India, um, Indian pharmaceutical companies. Uh, do not have the capability on the RNA side. Uh, whereas I think on uh, uh, like Covaxin and uh, other things, uh, uh, you know, where uh, uh, the technology is there. So even if it is given, I don't see uh, countries immediately being able to uh, you know, take advantage of it, including South Africa. Admiral, you have anything to add on this? See, on the issue of uh, cutting edge technology and patents, uh, we, in, uh, we Indians have all been saying, like, you please give us cutting edge technology, um, transfer of technology. Let me take a very specific example of aero engines. The Indians have, uh, India has been asking for aero engine technology, especially the hot end technology, which are the hot end of the aero engines. And no manufacturer, there are only five or six companies in the world which manufacture reliable aero engines. You can take G, Rolls Royce, Patton Whitley, then there's Semeca, France, then Mitsubishi. And the uh, Russians have uh, this thing. And to a degree. China is struggling for so cutting edge technology. Nobody is going to give you transfer of technology, whatever money you are going to be willing to pay, to pay also. So in my opinion, even uh, like uh, Professor Rajdeep has said, I'm, I doubt if uh, America will agree to waiver patents for manufacture of these vaccines. Okay, you, they may give you a license agreement to manufacture them, but then you will have to set up the facility from scratch from this thing. So that's a very different thing on doing license manufacture and transfer of technology and patents. So cutting edge technology, no country is going to give you transfer of technology on, in any field where they are the leaders in the world. You, you have to develop it yourself. And a prime example is ISRO organization. There was denial of technology and we have developed the technology ourselves. And now we are one of the leaders in space 
uh, and our launch platforms are reliable and the world is now looking at us as a partner to launch, put the satellites in this thing. So that's the way ahead. Uh, if I may add one particular point is, uh, you know, technology transfer, you know, it's part of a larger ecosystem. Uh, you know, it is not going to uh, be, it's not just about like, you know, giving an insight about one, it is about uh, the assemblages as they, you know, socialists talk about social concepts, but it's also in technology. Uh, and, uh, it, you know, just a day or two before, uh, there was a report, uh, commentary, uh, commentary in the New York Times by Thomas Friedman, uh, on the TSMC, the uh, Taiwan uh, Semiconductor Manufacturing uh, Company. Uh, and uh, they pointed out as to, you know, what is the uniqueness of the TSMC uh, is they rely on basically uh, creating an ecosystem uh, which is benefiting uh, from being a democratic, open uh, kind of a, uh, creating a culture that they can buy, uh, you know, technologies, uh, trade in technologies and uh, make uh, from all over the world, uh, Europe, etc. Um, and uh, what, and that is where you know he, he also points out that China, some you know, is a is manufacturer, you know, it has a manufacturer you know, powerhouse, but in some areas it's unable to do because it cannot just do it on its own. It still has to rely with the other in the world, and there there is tremendous lack of trust. Um, so uh, other countries have to completely go on their path to develop, like India was compelled to uh, develop the cryogenic uh, technology. Uh, but it needs, you know, an ecosystem. It's just not, you know, so countries have to fundamentally focus. Um, and this is one thing I, um, you know, as a, as a scholar, I, you know, uh, get worried when India and great power is mentioned even in a book. I think we should just focus on our own, you know. Uh, I do like the idea of Atmanirbhar, uh, but I think, you know, it shouldn't be just a, a slogan, but in terms of uh, an ecosystem uh, of, uh, you know, intellectual pursuits, an ecosystem which is open, you know, it shouldn't be, uh, we shouldn't be, uh, uh, um, you know, both in academia, be able to, how to say, challenge, um, you know, uh, uh, everything that, that we face with, you know, including whatever notions we have. And until we do that, uh, another small part, example that, you know, which shocked me was an aeroplane uh, like Airbus or Boeing. Um, it's, it's like a component of amalgamation of almost some three um, uh, lakh kind of, you know, distinct technologies, you know, from the ergonomic design of the chair to the material of the chair to the video system having its own high-end technology and all of them together have to be brought and that is what you know we should pursue uh, in you know uh, in general any country uh, uh, rather than and i think we are going to do we cannot just do by ourselves but also by engaging with countries which are open transparent democratic and that is where i think the indo-pacific could thrive uh, uh, rather than the security and other you know imaginations Right. Thank you so much. Uh, can I have the pleasure of having a, asking a last question? <laughs> yeah. Um, just, I mean, from my uh, research point of view, I'm, I've worked on the area of international migration. So uh, what are the rules that actually govern migration of people? Uh, and do you think it could be part of a, a rule-based uh, global order? I mean, of course, we had something called GATS and as a part of WTO, um, but how far it is viable, I'm not very sure. So what do you think? Uh, is there any uh, such rules like that? Uh, you know, migration uh, uh, has been thought in two ways. One is uh, in terms of, you know, forced. Um, and there we do have a, a regime which is in the form of the UN uh, Convention on Refugees. Um, and uh, to which India is not a party uh, because, you know, we are here, uh, but India has, uh, uh, as far as uh, in principle goes, uh, we have uh, tried to adhere to that uh, uh, convention. Um, um, we even uh, host uh, the South Asian offices uh, for the UN High Commission for Refugees. Uh, and India has been in the center uh, of, uh, of being a country where uh, uh, from neighborhood, you know, we, uh, we have had uh, migrants who come who are compelled to leave their countries. Mm -hmm. uh, with the regarding to uh, the larger, uh, you know, in terms of voluntary, uh, that is for economic opportunities, etc. Um, uh, the um, how to say, I think in you know, one way I would say is you know uh, you know build and they shall come kind of I think the logic is I think if um, uh, countries uh, create an ecosystem of uh, good you know education institutions. 
uh, of a good, uh, say like, you know, people have different ambitions, you know, uh, to, it could be to pursue a sport, to pursue education, to pursue. I think countries, if they rely on creating uh, the ecosystem in different areas, they will be, uh, they will attract, you know, top talent, uh, you know, so to say. Uh, the other way would be to provide direct, you know, uh, directed incentives, which China is doing, uh, wherein uh, they have been um, uh, trying to provide a pathway uh, to Chinese who have gone abroad and got the best of education, sport, you name it, uh, and they're trying to get them back and, you know, contribute, you know. So, um, uh, uh, but if there is an incentive for a person to leave, I think, you know, they are going to uh, do that. Either if they are forced, say, due to conflict, or if not, uh, they are going to, you know, people, uh, I think the impulse to uh, go find the best opportunities, I think is, is very, very strong. And nation states, you know, uh, can, um, uh, uh, can only try. Uh, but uh, one hope that the GATS uh, would try to create uh, uh, more, uh, but uh, you know, I think uh, that is definitely on the agenda uh, for the newer multilateral frameworks. Uh, that is, you know, there should be more seamless movement also. Uh, 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 you know, so um, uh, and they want you know, they want to do uh, pursue that for in CPTPP etc. Uh, to make it more seamless um, uh, and uh, uh, but I think even with, without you know states trying to put barriers, uh, they I think in um, uh, those who are willing uh, you know they 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 find many ways uh, you know to uh, we cannot I think that human uh, you know national boundaries are not going to easily stop uh, that we you know. Um, and I think maybe the technology, uh, you know, and the, what we have seen through pandemic might open up another avenue uh, to greater collaboration, greater interaction also. And, uh, um, uh, you know, one hopes reduce uh, the need to migrate, you know, if you want to acquire a skill, if you want to acquire something, um, because that, that's a big driver. No, no state, uh, to my knowledge, is, you know, encouraging its, you know, people to kind of, you know, this area, etc. You know, people, if they believe it's in you know, their interest, you know, that is something they want to pursue. Uh, they go to quite some extent, uh, uh, and states actually catch up, you know, with after the people have left, so to say. Uh, um, on the other side, uh, I mean, once they migrate, uh, uh, they become a stock of another country. Uh, how far these social security agreements? Why is it not picking up? Uh, and because uh, and because when we go abroad, uh, uh, there is a need for some social security for the migrants. Um, but it is all by uh, bilateral only. Um, as can we have a larger framework on that? I doubt, you know, because of the obvious, you know, part uh, in which you know today uh, we uh, our imagination is you know centered around um, uh, around you know political boundaries. Uh, Europe has you know uh, achieved some you know uh, quite a bit, uh, but there again uh, we have seen. Um, um, uh, you know, the nationalism, you know, were coming back. Uh, and one, um, you know, maybe it might not happen is, uh, uh, it appears even, you know, individuals, uh, even uh, for some, uh, the one thing that has been noti noticed in, is, uh, in um, um, those who migrate also, there is a really kind of like deep sense of, you know, those who are compelled or those who go voluntarily, they want to go back or, you know, they want to, you know, retain that tie. And I think, you know, so that's a very uh, strong that I think uh, where people are born. Uh, so, I, you know, um, uh, maybe at a regional level, it might be, you know, feasible, uh, but at a global level, um, in the, I think it's, it's uh, uh, at the moment, uh, okay. it's, uh, the focus, uh, international community is trying to focus more on, focus on vulnerable populations rather than um, those who are voluntarily uh, going. Thank you so much. Admiral, you have anything to say? No, I'm not an expert in this subject, but uh, when you're looking at migration, migration will always be determined by that country's rules, regulation, and laws. Mm -hmm. And you'll have to, whichever migrant is there, if you're a legal migrant, you have to abide by that. And uh, very few countries uh, allow dual citizenship, like India doesn't allow dual, either you're a citizen of India or of the country you migrated to. There are very few countries in the world which allow dual citizenship. And I think the rule of the land will allow to that person and you will be part of that social security. Like you take the case of Australia, if you want, if you say your 
your kid is there and you want to go and stay long term the visa costs that much more because you have to pay for the social security with ordinary australians are paid through taxes so if you want a five year visa you have to pay some 25 lakhs then you are part of the medical system of that rule of that particular country so the rule of that nation will apply to migrant i don't i doubt if you would ever going to have some international norm or rules for migration the land of the law law of the land will apply and you will be a citizen of one country very few countries allow dual citizenship thank you thank you